Hello and welcome back to Making the Jump, a video series about innovation in digital higher education. I'm your host, Justin Hodson, and in today's episode, we feature a conversation among five educators who are sharing tips and strategies for teaching online. So if this is of interest to you, stick around. So this summer, I've been tasked with leading a project team to transform Indiana University's face-to-face -face freshman composition course into a dynamic online learning experience. We committed early on this summer to just moving fully online with our delivery for the course uh, in the fall and the spring this year, and have been working on building that course all summer long. The project team and I have been creating a, a range of instructional resources for that course, its curriculum, its design, and today's episode of Making the Jump is actually one of those resources. I thought uh, it was of interest to not only that audience, but possibly of interest to the Making the Jump viewers and subscribers, so I wanted to, to provide it, uh, an access to this material here. The episode itself touches on matters ranging from how asynchronous elements and activities can inform synchronous conversations to specific strategies for teaching in Zoom. Um, it's a bit of a longer episode than usual, so if you visit the YouTube channel itself, uh, in the description there are timestamps that allow you to jump forward and backward in, of course, in the production uh, to get to the part you're specifically looking for or interested in. Um, as always, if you find today's episode helpful, be sure to hit the like button, and if you want to stay up to date on what we're doing here at Making the Jump, be sure to subscribe. Okay, so uh, here we are in OW131, right, this is online, W131, and our goal today is to provide uh, a bit of advice, tips, suggestions, uh, warnings, cautions, and all those things that we want to share with new instructors or new to online teachers who um, may be feeling a bit of trepidation with the online experience. And, and the good news is that the five of us have learned a lot uh, along the way of teaching online, and I've learned most of mine the hard way, so I'm happy to share with others so they don't have to struggle through the same things that we've gone through. Um, and I just want to sort of open up the conversation today. Uh, uh, take a minute to introduce ourselves uh, so that we can let people know who we are. So my name is Justin Hodson. I am a faculty member in the English department. And I'm Laura Roche. I also study digital rhetoric. Uh, Justin is my advisor and has somehow roped me into being interested in online writing pedagogies. Owen? Hey, uh, I'm Owen Horton. I'm also, like Justin, a faculty member at IU in the English department. Um, I specialize in film, um, but I uh, also teach a lot of rhetoric, composition, um, and have been teaching a lot of stuff online uh, before the pandemic even started. Alex? I'm Alex. I'm a visiting lecturer at IU, a recent grad from the PhD program, and I've been teaching online before the pandemic started for a few years now and have, have taught a lot of classes using Zoom for synchronous meetings. And Andrea? Yeah, and I'm Andrea Whitaker. Um, I'm also a recent PhD from the English department and a current visiting lecturer. And I think of us, I'm the newest to online teaching. I only started doing the online teaching this past spring uh, when the campus closed and then I've been teaching through the summer. Great, 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 perfect. So now that we know each other, right, as it were, um, my, as, a, as a quick starting point, like one of the things that I struggle with the most uh, when teaching online is that I talk exceptionally fast, right? Um, and the more excited I am about the course or the content or the conversation, the faster I go. And so it's incredibly hard for me to, to find ways to slow down. But, you know, a little tip and trick that I use a lot is I put post-it notes on my computer screen. Um, they're talking points. Some of them say slow down. Some of them remind me that you're going too fast or to pause and breathe and ask questions. And I know most instructors may not have this problem, but uh, for those of you who are fast talkers, I can't stress enough how important it is to have signs somewhere to remind you. Like I even have them color coded uh, depending on the meeting, but like I have yellow for talking points and green post-its for slowing down moments uh, with timestamps on them. Uh, and it's become a very formulaic approach, but it's improved my experience. And in fact, I wish in my face-to-face -face class I had those same post-it notes because it's, uh, it's an easier interface to work with for me to trigger that kind of moment. But uh, what about the rest of you? What are some of your uh, learning curve elements, some, some tips and things you have for them? Anyone want to go next? Yeah, um, I think one of the biggest things I struggled with was understanding the difference between assigning work um, that was just this work to make me feel better about the fact that they were doing something um, versus assigning work that's actually going to lead to some type of learning or discussion in the synchronous session. And I'm still not sure I feel totally great about the, the distinction between the two, but I know there is a distinction. 
um, and that when I'm thinking about what to assign them and um, where to push them, I generally want to focus on things that are going to make the synchronous session better. Um, that, that's my number one goal is to make the synchronous session feel good and worthwhile and something that they're actively engaged in. Um, and so things like quizzes, while necessary to make sure they did the reading, are not something to really focus on as much um, as discussion posts where we can actually get the student to you know, display some sort of identity or idea of their own um, in relation to the, the text itself. Great, great, I like it. Uh, I, I think to follow on with that, the, um, as you know, Owen and I talked about our experiences this summer, that less is more kept coming to the fore. Um, and it, you know, especially in some of the, the early weeks, I think it's easy to pack them with a lot of small things, a lot of constant quizzes that in the end don't really impact their learning as much as a single, you know, really substantive assignment or, you know, like one or two things that really prepare them to think through things in the discussion together. Yeah, yeah. that's actually one of the things I've written down to, to share the things I learned the hard way was uh, doing more with less, um, particularly in the asynchronous class, instead of trying to cram everything in and just talk even faster, uh, was thinking, what if I could only do one thing today, what is it going to be? And, and can I spend 20 minutes on it? And can I feel more for me, it was like, can I be comfortable? Just spending 20 to 30 minutes on one thing um, and make that work. And, and so I, I think that's, uh, for me, that's like tip number one is doing more with less or doing, you know, taking some things out of the way and don't feeling, and so you don't feel so rushed. I think doing one thing a day is just a general good rule for online uh, instruction simply because you want to al allow that time for it to develop. And it's not going to develop in the sense that you come to class, they all log in, and you say, hey, let's talk about this topic and you have this really great and fruitful discussion, that's not what's going to happen. That has to be sort of um, crafted and woven out of this sort of smaller little group assignments or mini chunks that you do to build towards actually having a, a halfway decent discussion. Um, and those things don't happen by accident. So you have to spend the entire class to get to that one 15 minute maybe discussion out of an hour class. Um, and, and so I always try to focus on like, what's the one thing we're doing today that can only be done in synchronous session. Yeah. Laura, what, what are your uh, go-to things here? Um, I didn't talk about this in my notes, but um, <laughs> just sort of to build on that. I think when I first started teaching online, I felt this um, unfamiliar need to like hold my students really accountable for things that I wouldn't have held them accountable for in the face-to-face -face classroom. Like there are 20 readings that they have to do for um, small heuristics. And so I was prioritizing those littler things just to make sure that the students did it. Not because I was necessarily concerned that they knew um, MLA citation of a film scene. Uh, backwards and forwards, right? Um, so I think I think that's right. It's just sort of being, I don't know, more mindful of what you're asking students to engage with and why you're doing so. Um, but my probably number one tip for instructors would be to just like have a little bit of grace with yourself when you're teaching online um, for the first time and every time because it, it it's just so different um, when you're face to face you engage with 24 students and you're uh, negotiating these different personalities and you're trying to get everybody to work together um, you're still doing that online but you're doing it online so there are 24 people with different personalities and different technologies that um, make things potentially more difficult um, so I think just being patient with yourself, having some grace, and um, being patient with your students can be beneficial as well. I, um, I read this really great essay that made me think about where you started, Laura. It was called Against Cop Shit, and it was about this sort of like proliferation of surveillance, um, uh, I guess, enforcement surveillance into the classroom, right? Where we feel like, um, you know, I, and I felt this myself in the spring when they said, uh, you know, 
any student that wants to take an S can, and I'm teaching 131, and as you know, if a student gets lower than a C in 131, they fail the class. And my, I had this initial reaction, it's like, well, now some students that had like a D that were turning in nothing and failing can just take the S and pass, and, and that's unfair. And I had to really go like walk that back, like, hey, we're in a pandemic, maybe that's okay. Um, for a student that was struggling to to do that and I think that it's really easy because of the way canvas is set up like this almost like a gamified version of of like Doing a class. It's really easy to get bogged down in stuff that you're not really here to do um, and, and we, But you will feel that compulsion to, to be enforcing Did you do everything every single reading has to be done? Hey, I know you guys have been doing this reading that makes me upset Well, if you're not gonna talk about it in synchronous, who cares? if they really read it right um so again no no cop stuff in in what they want okay. it's a good rule for yourself because it's more work for you um you it's know, more stress for you one of the things that uh, i found to be true over the years is that a lot of folks as they make their first transition from being a teacher in the classroom to teacher online they become more and more inclined towards accounting they become accountants right and so I've been over the years trying to tell folks when you when you move online, you want to really focus explicitly on the experience and the experience design and don't worry so much about the accounting because the in this case, the filing cabinet that is Canvas will cover most of the accounting. And if you get bogged down in those small little things, you're going to A, uh, feel incredibly overwhelmed with the amount of labor that's involved, but B, you're missing the point and what you're focusing on with the students. It doesn't mean those th small things aren't important. They're just they're not important in the same ways because we have to craft a learning experience differently in the online box. But yeah, I too am guilty of the first time teaching online, like, nope, I'm going to mark every box. We're going to check everything. Uh, you know, for me, that was what, 2007, the first time I taught online. And so and it was definitely different than this experience, but um, same problems, you know, it's the same adjustment to teaching. So what is that? What, what do you wish you would have known uh, about teaching online before you started teaching online? It's okay, feel free to jump. I'll go. <laughs> um, just like regular face to face teaching, this will take from you what you let it. Um, so I had to learn, and thanks to Justin, I was like given permission, but um, to set limits for myself. Um, he told me, like, you should not be spending four hours responding to discussion posts, Laura. And um, I think because it was my first time teaching online, I needed somebody to say like, no, you, you shouldn't be doing that. Your time is probably better spent elsewhere. And um, as a graduate student, my time was needed in my coursework and in my like personal life, you have to keep a balance. And it's easy because our technological tools are with us all the time to just be constantly checking and, um, responding and so just sort of setting boundaries for myself was really really helpful and just knowing that that's a necessary part of productive like pedagogy it was i wish i would have prioritized that i guess when i started anyone else anyone? My tips are all about the synchronous session because I was okay. like thinking this whole thing was going to be about the synchronous session. No, no, it's fine. It's, uh, it's okay. I mean, it's, it's it, for us, it's just a matter of like, um, I don't want to control the agenda because we all have different experiences for what matters to us in the online, uh, which is why I left the questions incredibly vague <laughs> or generic. Um, I think, you know, Laura is onto something though, particularly if you're a new instructor and a grad student and you're trying to figure out like, where are my responsibilities? And this is true for early faculty. We all go through this too. Like, where should your energies reside uh you know and and if you were expected to do research for example you can't spend 70 percent of your time teaching it just doesn't work that way so um i think being okay with knowing you know what your boundaries are setting your boundaries and trying to stick to that is fine you're not going to be able to turn it all off but you also can't let it drive you crazy um and as you know i think some of our instructions on the discussion posts now are from laura's experience and, and owen had the same thing like no let's 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 look at them all together and then talk about them in class let's not try to respond individually to every student post because you know you'll lose all of your hair uh or, or whatever the, the the explanation is but um so we, alex you you have things for synchronous what are, what are your what are your go-to stuff for synchronous what are your tips and, and considerations there well, so I was thinking through this, and I think at the end of the day, a lot of the 
best practices for the synchronous session are not that different than best practices for a regular class, but they matter much, much more because um, things that are just like good ideas in a regular class that will make things, make an activity run more smoothly are things that are the only thing that will make the activity work if you're in a synchronous session. So um, I did a lot of group work in my physical meet space class and it would just be like, yeah, go into your groups. I'd give them loosey goosey instructions, but then like I could see when they were floundering and I could give them better instructions. And if, if someone wasn't working, I could come and loom over them menacingly and they would start working. And a lot of that just doesn't work in the synchronous session where they go into these little breakout rooms where you can only send like tiny blips of messages to them. You're not seeing them all. Um, so what I learned to like after years of doing this, the only thing that's made group work functional for me is to, I have a sheet that I send them in the chat for them to download. It has ex specific, very explicit directions that begin with choose your role. And everyone has a role. There's someone who's like the leader and is keeping time and screen sharing. There's someone who's taking notes and they're gonna email me the notes after class. There's someone who's gonna speak when we come back to the main room. And then like, there's just step-by-step -step instructions. Of course, all of that's very smart to do in a regular class, but you don't have to. But online, you, you almost have to be that explicit. Um, similarly, like cold calling in a regular class, it's better to like give them something to think about first. It's better to say, think about this for a minute and then cold call or say, write something down and then cold call. Online, like I think it's that much more important to say, everyone give me thumbs up or down on this and then call on someone or everyone say agree or disagree in the chat. And then, oh, Laura, why did you say that? Like the, the sort of the pause and think before you call on them. So it's, it's lots of stuff like that. Stuff you should always do, but online you really have to always do it. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Go mm -hmm. ahead. Andrea. I just wanted oh, to yeah, yeah. clear I, directions are the most important thing. <laughs> yeah. I, so much of that, Alex, I ended up doing in my classroom as well. Like, a, especially the very specific worksheet with steps that you send to everybody before class. Like, that ended up being my go to move, especially for breakout rooms. But um, also, sometimes just to kind of guide them through the lesson or make the lesson more interactive. Like, um, sometimes I would split the worksheet up into like, here's the first half with like two questions that we're going to address in the course of the lesson, and that I will like cold call on you, you know, to answer. And then the second half have that kind of lead naturally into their breakout discussion. Um, and yeah, it's just, uh, you can even see it in how we're interacting here. Like you kind of need the cold call to prompt people when to speak, not because people don't want to talk, but because you're missing all of the cues that you would have in a physical classroom for when someone's going to talk, when they're finished talking, who wants to talk next, um, all of that stuff. I have also had, in terms of like synchronous classroom management, one of the things that I really, um, that, that I think is harder to foster in an online class is that sense of um, camaraderie or community, like the sense that the students know each other and like have these regular interactions with other people besides you. So one of the things that worked well for me was pre-assigned breakout rooms that were consistent across uh, an entire unit. I would, you know, switch them up periodically, but give them a sense of continuity so they're regularly speaking to some of the same people, so they, they get a sense of, um, you know, who else is in the class, and they have these regular conversations with them. Um, and to facilitate that, I started with a survey that I sent them in the non-synchronous component that just ask them, like, describe yourself as a group member, like, what kind of participant are you? What type of group do you like to be a part of? You know, like, what group dynamic are you looking for? And then I grouped them based on that and used that for the pre-assigned breakout rooms. I like that. I'm going to steal that. Just so you know. how, did you, how did you split them up? Did you put all of the I don't do works together and all the leaders together, or did you distribute that evenly? Um, sometimes I did that. Um, I... I had a group, for instance, that in the, the third unit, so the final uh, group that they worked with in the class, um, I had a group of students who had said in their feedback, like, I'm always the person in the group that talks. And what I would really like is a group that talks as much as I do. So I put all of those students together. Um, so I, I think it's not a bad idea to put the leaders together from time to time. Um, but I've also, sometimes I try to balance the group. So there's one person who, you know, is more of a speaker who's maybe comfortable being the person that shares with the rest of the class when they come back. 
but pair that person with some other people who you know are active thinkers who who engage well in the small groups maybe than they do in the in large groups so it, it's kind of fun i think to try to match them up and try to create these groupings that will work well for everybody you know i think one thing that that um this this sort of partners off what alex was talking about earlier too is that there's actually a way in the in the online classroom that you will really never have a technical cold call um, because you can always prep them ahead of time through with discussion boards and stuff like that, that they have answered something um, that you can come back to. And I like to use the discussions a lot for that. And I, I think Laura, you mentioned like answering discussion board questions for four hours. Um, what I like to do in my class is go through the discussion board as a class. Um, so I will answer stuff, but then we go through as a whole class. And I think I do that for a couple of reasons. First of all, a lot of them ask the same questions, um, which indicates to me that A, there's a problem I need to speak to the whole class about um, rather than just one or two people, and B, that they're not reading each other's questions um, because they're asking this is almost word for word the same question, even though they've already answered it. So that also um, allows them to, it sort of like gets them in the practice of like, hey, I can actually learn things from what my peers have asked. Um, and I didn't think to answer, ask this question, but now I have an answer to it. Um, and all of that allows me to sort of go through and say, hey, you know, Justin, you asked this question. Um, what made you think of that or what, what brought you that? Or if we have another more general discussion post, I could say something like, you know, hey, Laura, um, you brought this up. Um, what, what made you notice that in text? Or uh, maybe where would you see that in our other text? You know, to sort of show that the discussion board is maybe just the start of thinking rather than the end point. And also show that the discussion board has a purpose beyond just that check off of the assignment that it's actually something that leads them to um, discussion and synchronous session. Um, so, so really we can set up so there's no such thing as cold calling, uh, which is which is an awesome benefit of the online class. If we I do like it, that right. way of thinking about it, because like we think of cold calling normally as a really negative term, but it also seems really essential to make the synchronous class work, but maybe to understand that we're never truly cold calling. It's like it's cool calling. And, and there are ways to like soften it, either by basing it off of stuff they've done prior to the class or by giving them time to reflect or write something in the chat, something like that. Yeah, I was, I was gonna say, if we do it right, right, it, sh it should feel like it's an integrated element. Too much of the, the asynchronous content um, often feels like the busy work you do before you have to meet and then you move on. But truth be told, if, if we leverage those learning elements as a functional part of the synchronous conversation, then the work they do is part of the conversation we're having, not in addition to or separate from the conversations we want to have or the, the demonstrations we want to provide. And so, um, cool calling. This is uh, <laughs> this is the new term, right? We're no longer cold calling. We're cool calling. We're going to set people up. Um, just uh, curious, uh, what is uh, oh, and you're talking about advantages about the online. What are you, what is your favorite part of teaching online? Right? Anyone in general? I'm curious. I like when you get it right how much better it feels than when you get it right in the face-to-face -face classroom. I don't, like, Explain. I, I love teaching and I love seeing my students. Um, so a lot of the energy that I get from face-to-face -face class, the like face-to-face -face class is just like literally that physical energy. Um, and so I walk out just like, awesome. Um, <laughs> So when that happens online, it is a rush. <laughs> it's <laughs> absolutely wonderful. Like when the discussions go well, um, I feel so much better. First of all, because I prep them more than I would have prepped a face-to-face -face, uh, discussion. Um, but it also just feels like um, people have to like actively choose to participate online in a way that face to face classroom doesn't always it doesn't always feel so deliberate um so maybe that maybe the just the like conscious conscientiousness of the classroom online and that if that makes sense at all <laughs> i think i think something that strikes me is that um online teaching is different than face to face and that when we look at online, I think it's really easy to be like, oh, it's worse or it's, it's less effective because we're judging it through the same spectrum or the same lens to use a 131 term as, as we do face to face. Um, and so I think that your first time teaching it, you're probably gonna be very frustrated and feel maybe slightly more negative about it because it doesn't go like a face to face classroom. It's an entirely different structure. 
my favorite thing about online is that all the busy work gets taken care of not during class. And so that class is like this really pure moment um, where we are, we are just working on like one really intense thing and we're working through it together. Um, and there's ways for them to, uh, there's ways for us to sort of like bring in other, other elements um, to go through things together. Um, and I'm uh, thinking of a specific example of we, uh, in my literature class that I taught online, um, well, I went through all their paper topics and we kind of went through it together. Um, it had actual other students chiming in with each other, which I don't know that that would happen in a, in a first of all, you wouldn't do that in a face to face because you got 24 students sitting around listening to you talk to one student. But like in the online thing, it worked because they were taking notes and, and sort of um, responding to each other's uh, topics or their proposals for their, for their final essay. Um, so I think it'll be really important if you want to have a good experience teaching online to understand that online is different um, and you're not going to have the same successes. You know, you're not going to have that, that day when people are just chatting across um, like might happen in, in a real class, a face-to-face -face classroom. Um, but you can have a different version of that, which is the discussion boards leading into other types of discussions, right? So you have to sort of reframe the way you think about it um, in order to have those good times that Laura's, Laura's talking about. Yeah, no, my, uh, I don't know you, but my favorite thing is, and it's, it's completely personal, is that the teaching online forces me to be explicit in ways that I'm not in the regular classroom. And if I'm not, I, you can't cheat online because if you'd failed to be explicit, the whole thing breaks down, right? It's immediate in terms of how bad you are at doing something. Whereas in the face-to-face -face classroom, you know, it's much easier to get, to get by with a set of notes and a quick conversation or, you know, the charismatic engagement or you float around and you're on the spot, you change the rules, but, but in the box here in the, in the zoom meeting or even in the canvas space, if you haven't taken the time to really design the lesson ahead of time and think about how you're going to move through the parts and how those parts are going to work in relationship to each other, uh, it very quickly breaks down and everyone has a bad experience um, in, or at least a boring experience. And to me, being boring is worse than being bad. At least bad experiences are entertaining at some times or they tell their friends like you wouldn't believe what this guy did right but um boring classes never get talked about so but yeah i think to me it's the the way it naturally forces me to be explicit and otherwise i you know if i'm busy i kind of cheat in a regular classroom as a bad habit um, but i can't get away with that online there's no there's no cheating i just remembered another thing i love a student missing class is not a problem because they can watch the recorded lecture afterwards <laughs> And that's so huge. It really is huge because um, when, you, as you know, as a teacher, when a student misses a class or misses two classes or maybe even misses three classes, you, uh, at least me, um, sometimes I'm struggling to even remember what they've, like what we've gone over. And when they come up to me a week and a half later and say, what did we do when I was gone? <laughs> sometimes I don't remember because I'm just kind of winging it. Um, with the online class, I can just be like, here, just go watch this and you'll know exactly what happened. And it captures the authentic. Um, it's not like reading another student's notes, right? Or asking a classmate what happened or asking me what happened. They can just get the uh, actual experience minus the participatory elements right there. And so I love that there's a documentation of it. And if you ever feel really stuck, you can go back and watch last semester's version of this class. What did I do? What worked really well? And kind of you'll have that immediate uh, sort of um, access to that moment again. So the surveillance part that I sort of talked shit about earlier has some positive benefits <laughs> to it, um, which is that the, the, the record is always there for you to go back to. Yeah. A, a couple of things that I liked that, you know, I, I think my favorite things were things that were possible in the online teaching that were not possible in the Facebook space. Um, and one of those for me, um, it, whether you're using Hypothesis or like some other tool, but the like shared annotation thing works so well online and you can use it as a you know like synchronous classroom activity sometimes or you can use it as an asynchronous kind of like note sharing as you're thinking through maybe one of the the course essays or something that you know requires a lot of complex processing um, that kind of thing is just it hasn't been available in the face-to-face -face course and it doesn't work exactly the same way in face-to-face -face as it does in online so that i think there are some really exciting things that are possible pedagogically only in the online space. Um, and sort of related to that, one of the things that I liked about my online experience this summer was the office hours, um, which I did through uh, like 
Um, I used Calendly. I think there are lots of different apps and things you can use for this, but just, you know, like a scheduling sign up and I would block off the hours that I was available and they could see, you know, what was available to sign up for. And I think there's an accessibility to that that isn't there when the student has to like come to your physical office hours and find the building and find your office. And, you know, there's something more intimidating about that, I think, for a lot of students. Um, whereas this, um, I, I think more people used my office hours because there was, you know, there was online sign up that they could see what was available and what wasn't. They had a sense of, you know, you're not taking up my time. You can see the time that is available for the office hours. You know, actually, that's one of the things we talk about a lot is how much the online teaching has improved our in-person teaching. Uh, and something I started, I don't know, five years ago or so, six maybe, uh, right after I got to IU for sure, but definitely even when I was at Texas, was I started making my office hours available in person or online. Mm -hmm. And students, when they would tell me they were coming to meet, they could just say, hey, can I meet with you? I'm not going to be able to make it. Can we meet online? Uh, and, you know, it's surprising how much that opens up for students. I'm, you know, I'm having office hours, but I'm, you know, I'm seeing two students, but only once actually come into my office today. So it's, uh, that practice was so beneficial uh, in the online experience that I, it's now something I do. Uh, well, of course, now everything's online, but, <laughs> but I mean, before the pandemic, it was something I did anyways. And so I think it's great that you're finding that experience. I've yet to get so good to, I've scheduled a calendar invite link, but, um, but, I'm, but I just don't know if I can plan that far in advance. But, you know, I do like this idea of making it available to them to click and the accessibility thing that it offers is incredibly valuable. I love what you said about, Andrea, about um, the things that like are only possible in the online experience. Because I find, I think initially I was trying to figure out, oh, there's this thing I do in the regular classroom. How do I do that in the online classroom? And the best things have actually been things where it's like, this is something I can only do in the online classroom. This isn't a limitation of the environment. It's something that it enables. So I'm a really big fan of the chat box. Not everyone is, but it enables some cool things. Like I can ask everyone to type a piece of analysis and then I can ask them to like read through everyone's and like vote for who's we like best. And we can talk about it. How would you do that in a regular class? You would have students come up like one by one on the chalkboard and write something and then be squinting at it. It just wouldn't happen. Whereas when you're online, that happens like that. It goes so quickly. They type, they look, you talk. And so like there are a lot more opportunities for students to write and see each other's writing and give each other feedback. And then the chat is also nice too. If you can get students to use it this way, I encourage them to like type in it as we're having verbal discussions as well. And what happens is my introverted students who might otherwise not say anything, type these really beautiful comments in the chat. And then I'll, we'll be talking away loudly, but I'll look at the chat and someone will have said something very thoughtful that I think would have gotten lost probably in a regular classroom. So there are just a lot of cool things that can happen in this space that wouldn't happen in, in meet space. Great, great, great. I like, I like that we have all this stuff. Uh, um, and I wish that we'd had these conversations many years ago before I started teaching myself. Like, oh, where were you guys at when I was trying to figure this out? Um, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a rough, rough go. So my uh, last kind of question I want us to think about are, it, um, or is, uh, what are the areas in which you get stuck and or what are your uh, like go-to things for getting unstuck? Um, and it can be synchronous or it could be grading. It could be, um, I mean, I, we have lots of these things we've talked about. You know, so one of my favorite practices, of course, is the audio-visual commenting on the end of a student paper rather than just writing um, because so much of the class gets, you know, de um, disembodied that the more I can put my voice back into the conversation I have with them, the better. And we were talking the other day as a group about what do you do when students don't talk, right? Those kinds of things. So I'm curious, what are your, what are your uh, okay, this is where I get stuck or occasionally have troubles and here's what I do as my go-to solution or when in doubt, here's what we're doing today. You know, I actually found a huge benefit in the audiovisual comments as well. The benefit was that I was able to identify, I was forced basically to identify one or maybe two major issues um, that I wanted the student to work on for the next paper. And I mean, that's something I try to do my written feedback, but it's harder because you're noticing, hey, well here, this, this, I didn't really, this, this wasn't really worded well, or um, the source you used here wasn't great or whatever. And so you get kind of bogged down there. Whereas you, if you think about a, you know, a, an 18 year old student reading this, um, and they're like, well, he's telling me that my thesis isn't working, but like I can fix this citation pretty easily. So I know which one I'm gonna actually do in a revision. Um, so, but when you do the audiovisual, 
um, because you know mine are generally like less than three minutes. Um, so what you what you're forced to do is attack the the highest order concerns, right? And say like, look, this thesis wasn't working, and here's why, and here's what you can do to fix it. Um, and it just to me it feels more fluid, it feels more human, and it, like I said, it forces me to identify laser in on the most important things rather than um, you know doing the important things but burying that in a bunch underneath a bunch of other things that I would like them to improve. Um, so I, I did like the, the audiovisual feedback for that. I mean, it's also to me, it's just a little easier to do too. Um, and I, I find it just more effective for that reason. That wasn't really your question. But no, no, but it, it does point out one of the things that we talk about a lot. When people always ask like, why do you do audiovisual commenting? Doesn't that take forever? And I always say, surprisingly, it actually gets faster than trying to write comments because I don't waste time with the compliment sandwich. I don't edit what I've written. I just, I'm like, hey, here's what I read. This is your grade. And here's why I think it's a B plus. And it's because you've got a broken thesis or, you know, whatever the case may be. And, and here's what I want you to do to fix it, you know, um, or here's something to consider. So I, I uh, most people don't believe me that, that it's faster, but it really is once you get into it, once you develop a workflow that works for you, it, uh, it picks up pretty quickly. Um, so you know, and the, and the trap is believing that our students are, are necessarily reading all of our feedback thoroughly and understanding it and stuff like that. And so we, we write feedback for students, I think, I think sometimes as if they're us, right? And that they're, they're looking to revise this. And unfortunately, revision isn't a core part of this, this class, but like what we're really trying to do when we give them feedback on the paper is to make sure that the next paper does not make those same mistakes and that they, the mistakes they make with their next paper are maybe different ones and less important ones. Um, and I think the audiovisual really helps me focus on that a lot. Um, that like, hey, you, we're not gonna do anything to fix this paper. Um, I can tell you why you're ready to degree, but here's, it's, it's, it, makes, it allows me to really project forward a lot more um, and give them momentum, which I think is really what I'm looking for in grades. Just one quick comment. I haven't had any grade complaints since I started doing audiovisual comments, except one student who said she wanted to meet with me to discuss the grade, and then I showed her the audiovisual comment, and she was like, oh, I understand now. So she just hadn't watched it. It is true. It does solve a lot of those kinds of problems. And I think it's because, um, A, they can hear you, and that you're not attacking them. There's a sincerity with which you respond, right? Uh, which the written words don't always feel that way. Uh, and you know, and, and sort of two or B, there's like a there's a connection there of care uh, and an involvement um, and rationalization that doesn't it's harder to argue with. Um, I think in general, um, but uh, so anyways, uh, some of my other problems that I run into: uh, what do you do with the class that refuses to talk? Right? What do you do with the class that refuses to start a conversation? Or as Andrew pointed out earlier, it's hard to do things because we don't know who's talking when. Um, and so I have a couple of, like for me, I have a couple of tips that I use. Uh, I'm a big fan of the think, pair, share, active learning strategy. I call it think, pay, think, pair, make, share. So they think about their project. They maybe talk about it or write down some ideas. And then I have them make something in like Adobe Spark where they make an image and they share that. And then I just call on those who've created images to say, what did you make here? And how did you, how does this connect to our reading? Um, and those kinds of things. I think facilitate a natural comment. It's not cold calling anymore. It's prompted, right? Um, the other one is I occasionally will sign uh, sign like uh, champions for given days. So to, you know, for days on Tuesday this week, you three are my champions. Next week, you three, and we just kind of rotate so that those three students know on this Tuesday I'm responsible for being a key component of the conversation um, in some meaningful way. And so I mean, it, it doesn't work in every class. It depends on the, the structure, of course, but. Um, those work for me both in the classroom, but also definitely online because then it takes some of the guesswork out of who responds to what part and when because we know well We know we have a champion to start with and then we kind of go from, from that. But what about what about the rest of you? I would I would echo that um, Those sentiments the days that I rely most heavily on full class discussion are the days right after they've read their course text um, their course essay, whatever. Um, and I do what Owen had mentioned earlier, which is use their discussion posts and the prompts that were provided there, perhaps, to um, facilitate discussion, to start discussion. And I, I like to give them the opportunity to talk in small groups and then come back. But um, regardless of if I do that or not, I always have four or five questions that I know I'm going to be asking beforehand. Um, 
and I distribute those. They might be what I've pulled from the uh, discussion post. And I tell my students, like, you five have to answer this out loud. You five have to answer this out loud, blah, 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 blah. Um, I would love for everyone to talk about everything, but I definitely need to hear from so-and-so, so-and-so, and so-and-so -and -so -and -so on question three. And so that way, um, it kind of, it's kind of like cool calling, but <laughs> anticipatory in that we're at question two, so Alex knows she has to talk, and it, it saves us from the like, and who wants to go now? Sort of well, well, if you don't have a plan, right? You can end up if you have a fifty-minute class, you can spend ten minutes of silence oh, while sure. in in throughout the day while you wait for someone to respond, and you're going to lose that time. So I think having some sort of talk plan works. I'm Andrea. You mentioned that you use Hypothesis this the summer, right? Yeah. Um, and I'm thinking that Laura, your discussion will, will now become the Hypothesis model in the W131, and how. Uh, I wonder how great that works. Like, I'm, I'm intrigued to think about even just pulling up the actual hypothesis document in class. Be like, hey, look, 17 of you commented on this apostrophe, saying it was out of place. I mean, whatever the, you know, sky comma, as I like to call them, right? So, uh, you know, but I'm curious, how did that work uh, in your practice this summer? Um, well, I, I've used it both ways. So you can use it as an asynchronous component where um, I assign them specific things, like um, look for this type, you know, comments on a passage that you thought was really interesting. Um, find a word that you don't know and define it. You know, give them specific assignments for what to look for and comment on. Um, reply to one other person's comment, something like that. And then you can use those in the synchronous sessions to pull from in the same way that you would a discussion post. Like, oh, several of you flagged this passage, so we're going to start a discussion here, and you can call on those specific people who already have stuff prepared, who have already thought about that passage. Um, you can also use, I wasn't using hypothesis for this at this point, but you can also use shared annotation to do things like um, let's in our synchronous class look at a rough draft together and, you know, like find errors, find things that you can improve upon, find things that this writer is doing really well. And, you know, sometimes I would assign um, kind of like what Laura was writing, like, um, you know, here, these five of you find something this writer's doing really well. These five of you, you know, find a substantive, uh, you know, idea-based thing that they could improve upon. Um, and then use the, okay, now that you've commented on those, let's hear from so-and-so. Like, tell me more about why you think this could be improved. So you can use it also in the, in the synchronous component, either to, you know, talk about maybe a, a specific passage of an essay that you'd like them to comment on on the spot, and then use that to lead into the verbal discussion, or you can use it, you know, for editing, for looking closely at a rough draft um, in preparation for their own writing. I like that. I like that. Interesting. Think, Go ahead. Oh, Alex. sorry. I I love that. I love all these ideas. They all speak to like the importance of being prepared before you come to class and having a plan before you come to class, which I'm big on too. But then there's also the inevitable things don't go according to plan and, and things are stalling in the class. And I think some of us have talked about these moments that come up where you're talking, maybe you, you had to quickly explain a concept or something. And then you're asking, you know, did you guys get that? And everyone's just staring at you or I don't know. There are these moments of silence and these moments where you're not getting feedback from them. And sometimes they are listening and they do understand and you just can't tell because the feedback mechanisms are missing. Um, and sometimes they really are like zoned out on Facebook and it's hard to know the difference. So I, in a regular class, I can tell when they're with me. And in a, in, a, in a Zoom class, I can't always tell if they're with me. So I have to build in the feedback. I have to say like, okay, everyone who agrees with that, give me, or everyone who understood that, give me thumbs up, thumbs down if you don't, thumbs sideways. And I look at them in tile view and I can see, like I can take, but you have to, you don't get the temperature of the room naturally. You have to take the temperature of the room. You have to ask for the feedback. You have to say everyone type agree or disagree in the chat. Everyone um, type the criterion they're most concerned about in the essay. Everyone do this. Or so, or like, you know, everyone take this quick poll. You can launch the poll thing and get into Zoom and quickly write a poll and have every, like I, it's important to ask everyone for, for feedback. And the more frequently you do that, the more they stay with you. Like they need to be frequently, every few minutes, there has to be some kind of response or something required from them. Um, 
So for, for talkers, I'm a talker to Justin and it works. So it works. I think it works well. Sorry. I think it works well in a regular class. It probably doesn't work as well in a regular class as I think it does even. But again, like that best practice of not talking too much, not lecturing too much, being active, that's important in a regular class is vital in the online class. And so you really have to watch yourself. Yeah. I mean, Zoom has that like reactions button now. Yeah. Um, yeah. But when I started teaching it, that wasn't there. So I would do this. I would have my students like do the thumb scale. Like, where are you at? And I did it so often that the next semester when I was back in the classroom, it was just a part of my teaching practices. Um, and so I agree, Alex, it's it's checking in more often than probably feels natural at first. But eventually it just you're just like, where where are you at? What do you think? <laughs> Uh, yeah, no, it's, uh, I, I mean, first off, I want to say there's nothing wrong with lecturing in, in online learning, but the, the challenge is that if we're going to lecture, it doesn't need to be a synchronous meeting, right? Um, it, you can make that as recorded video. Uh, and so if you're looking at a lecture, it's going to take more than 10 minutes, then it should just be a video um, that you give to them ahead of time. And, and you know, if you want to add points to it or whatever, that's fine. But, uh, but sometimes we're in the middle of a conversation. And someone asks a question and we try to explain it and then we get back to another topic and we've been talking for eight minutes because not because we wanted the lecture but because the, the what needed to be covered ended up going that route right and it's those things that i find that are sometimes hard to get back into the rhythm if i've been talking too long um and so one of the tips that i like uh, for that is if i if i go for very long at all i say can someone tell me back uh, pair it back to me the main two ideas that i just talked about are covered can you explain it to me because a i'm pretty sure i confuse myself uh, and, and B, I want to make sure that you're all still awake, right? So, um, and again, if you're like me and you talk incredibly fast, you can cover, you know, like an entire semester in eight minutes. So, uh, you know, like we need the checkpoints. So I'm, I'm with you. And that's actually one of my post-it notes, uh, uh, Alex, that I include is uh, not just time checks and breathe, but, you know, ask for feedback, ask for talking points, uh, particularly with uh, the online class, because otherwise it's, who knows what's going on, right? One of the things, this wasn't necessarily a challenge with, you know, like the online classroom management in terms of the students. But um, one of the things that was really intimidating to me, you know, going into synchronous sessions in particular was just managing the technology. And, you know, we've talked about there's so many interesting things you can do with Zoom pedagogically. But when you're first getting started with online, it's very difficult to manage all of those things. And your, your attention is split. In, in a dozen different directions and it's hard to keep tabs on your lesson plan and the you know the tile faces and the chat and you know uh, so I would say in terms of advice for for people who are coming newly into online teaching is don't try to manage too much I think especially at the beginning just picking you know have two windows and whether that's the face tiles and the chat or maybe the face tiles and your lesson plan um, or some post-it notes on your computer, you know, if you want to go that route. Um, and then you'll slowly adapt to managing all those different things at once. And there's no easy way to do it. It just comes with time and practice. So I'd say like all these, these cool tools and like interesting things that we're talking about, don't feel like you have to integrate them all at once or that you should even try to do them all at the same time. Like hey, choose your battles wisely, I think. And especially as you're first getting into it, you know, there is going to be a learning curve, but just know that at the end of it, you will be able to do these things eventually as you practice. Okay, well, we got about uh, a couple minutes left here before we have to wrap up. Um, Cause like every other meeting we have in, in life at this point, I have another meeting to go to, right? That's how it always works. Um, the, uh, I think, you know, if you have any last thoughts, I want to give you an opportunity to share that. But so one of my last things that I like to encourage folks, if they have this capacity, is to log in under two machines. So to create a Zoom account that you log into as a teacher, of course. Um, but then if you can, to also log in with another device. Sometimes an iPad works or whatever, another computer. Um, if you have two screens, maybe you just you set up two screens for different kinds of set settings. I also like to occasionally call in on my phone. Um, and, and the reason is that A, it gives me a chance to see what the students see, if I can do it on two different machines at the same time. Uh, but B, if I'm having technical problems uh, with my headphones or my audio, I can call on my phone and talk and they can at least still hear me. Or if I'm also logged into the room and I and me, the host, gets kicked out and the room doesn't shut down, me, the guest, can still at least be in the space. 
Um, and if you've had any trouble with Zoom over the last six months, you'll know that that's incredibly helpful. I've been kicked out of, I've had Zoom shut down on me three times and all three times I was in a class. Like it, it never shuts down when it's just me hanging out by myself. I mean, I do that a lot apparently, but, um, but yeah, but when you're in class, it, these things inevitably happen. So I'm making sure that I, if you can do it, you know, as you get past the window of learning how to manage basic things um, and you're starting to add stuff, having a second login or a backup option has been incredibly helpful for me uh, throughout the years. So. Always have a backup device and if possible, encourage your students to do the same. They don't all realize that they can come to class via a phone. And of course, you don't normally want them coming to class by phone because then they don't have a keyboard and stuff, but it's a great backup option. And I, for the first time this summer semester, had to use my backup option because we lost power, which meant we lost we lost Wi-Fi. So I had to dash with my phone out to the front step of class. And then the rest of class was a discussion that I led from my phone and it was not ideal, but it was fine because I had my backup device. And if, and if your Zoom space is set to record automatically, as long as the room is still running, the recording will continue in, in theory, unless I use change those settings, but um, so yeah. All right, any, any other I would, I would go. I would actually go sort of in the opposite direction as well, not to disregard what you're saying, but like, it's also because we're recording these classes and stuff like that, um, students will, they want to do well, they want to work hard, they're, they're, they're good students. And they will sometimes, I've had students be like, look, I'm driving back from Indy right now, I can be on my phone during class. And I'm like, no, 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 <laughs> you no. just watch the video, watch the video when you get home. And, and so like, that's a huge thing as well is that like, yeah, they can call on their phones. If, if something happens, it can go down. But like, um, this isn't something where like, you know, in a face-to-face -face class, if they're not there, they're absent. There are ways for them to be present and participatory in class that go beyond just being there from that hour and 15 minutes or that 50 minute session. Um, and I think that's a huge benefit of this is thinking about ways where they could still be a part of class without being there for that one slim band of time. Um, is is a really big benefit of online, and we and we have we have practices in place for this online for the class this year. I don't know if they're going to stay that way long term, but uh, for twenty twenty one, you know, if a student misses a class, we have a recording available. We have options for them to not only watch what they learn, but then to engage the content in a way that mimics at least somewhat um, a face to face class. So, should they so choose, they can of course just choose not to do anything. But you know, um, that comes with penalties. But but yeah, so we have those options because I too have had students who've tried to take class. From their car while driving someplace uh and the answer is always no hang up <laughs> call me later be safe i mean for crying out loud so uh any any last thoughts or final comments no we're good i'm sure that we all have lots more to share and comment on because we've had such a, a, a range of experiences and a range of classes over the years but uh, we will continue to come back to this and i believe we're going to set up um various sort of support groups throughout the the fall uh, and and have options to talk with people further uh, but i really want to just say thank you all for participating today and for sharing your knowledge i'm sure that the folks who may get a chance to watch this will enjoy them and and laura says hey, where do we where do we sit right now we all thumbs up today oh one's in the middle that's good uh all right well that that will conclude today's lesson i hope you enjoyed our show uh, and tune in for more at a later date